Because it is the perfect work. Nothing is missing there. It's perfectly done. It's a perfect work. It's perfectly perfect and completely complete. There is nothing to be added, nothing to be taken away. It is done perfectly. When God does it, He does it perfectly. Let me read to you a couple of verses from the New Testament. The book of Hebrews chapter 7, verse 27, tells us in no uncertain terms that it is indeed that Jesus was the sacrifice. It is his blood that was shed upon the altar. This whole thing about Leviticus 1711, this whole thing is about Jesus Christ. 727, our high priest does not need daily as those high priests that is the Old Testament high priest, to offer up sacrifices first for his own sins and then for the people's. He doesn't have to do that. Our high priest is Jesus. He doesn't have to do what the Old Testament people did. They have to offer first sacrifice for themselves and then for the people. For this one, that is this Jesus, our high priest, he did once for all when he offered up himself. See, when he offered of himself, that was enough. Because he didn't have to offer up any sacrifice for himself. When he offered up himself as a sacrifice, it is for us. It was not for him. It is only for us. This is the blood that was given at the altar of altar called the cross that it, Leviticus 17.11 is referring to. Turn with me again to ninth chapter, Hebrews chapter 9. Let me read to you verse 13 and 14. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? Now, it's talking about those, the blood of bulls and goats. 
if they can help to cleanse, you know, everything was cleansed by that. Every, it was sprinkled on everything so that everything can be, it was sprinkled on the altar so that the altar can be cleansed, sprinkled on the vessel so that they can be cleansed. Everything was cleansed by that. If that can do that, how much more the blood of Jesus, it is saying. But look at the way it says, it answers some questions. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself, Without spot to God. Why is he pulling the eternal spirit over here? What is the eternal spirit doing here? And why does he say that when Jesus offered his blood as a sacrifice, he offered it through the eternal spirit? Why does he put it in that way? Verse 14. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from the dead works to serve the living God? Why is he pulling that concept of the eternal spirit, through the eternal spirit, Jesus offered himself, his blood that was shed and so on. Why? It means that even though the blood was shed 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary, its impact and effects are valid for all eternity. When I say all eternity, eternity past, Eternity includes the past, present, and future. From Adam, all men until Jesus. And then from Jesus, all men to the last man. All those that live until now and all those that will live hereafter. All sins of every single person, everything that every, every, every sin that everyone has committed is punished in this one person. The blood is the penalty that was paid for all men, for all eternity. The blood is applicable for eternity. The effect of the blood, the power of the blood to cleanse is good enough for all eternity. That's why one man's sin 2,000 years ago, one man's, I'm sorry, not one man's sin, one man's death, one man's suffering, can be a punishment for all men's sin, and it can be the punishment for all men's uh, violations. Okay? All right. Now, so the remedy is the blood of Jesus, and the Bible very clearly says that. Now, think about this. There is no belief system, no religion of any kind, no belief system of any kind that offers anything that is like this that resembles even anything so, uh, close to this. There is nothing in the whole world, no religious system or system of belief that says anything like this, that, that God's Son came and He became our sacrifice, that He died on a cross and that He shed His blood and gave His life so that we may have life so that our penalty can be paid, so that our sins may be washed and forgiven. There is no religious system in the world that says anything like this. Just consider this. The fact that a man died 2,000 years ago, and that man happens to be God's son, he died in unusual circumstances. He never did anything wrong, so he didn't die for his own sin. He didn't die for it, any fault of his. Here is a perfect man that ever lived on this earth. The most perfect, never sinned, did only good. Healed people, delivered people, blessed people. Saint he was. He never sinned, he had no sin in him. That man died 2,000 years ago. Very unusual for a person like that to die and die such a horrible death. Isaiah 53 says that he was so disfigured that they can't even look upon him. That he didn't even, he lost even the appearance of a human being. Isaiah 52 verse 14 says that. Even the appearance of a human being was lost. So marred was his visage, the Bible says. Disfigured he was. So horrible the death was. Why should a saintly man who has never sinned for no fault of his die like that? What caused people to kill him like that? Pilate washes his hands saying, I find no fault with him. You guys are bringing all kinds of accusations against him, but it means nothing. He has violated no law. 
He has violated nothing. He has done anything, nothing wrong. I'm washing my hands. I'm clean, he says. But then hands him over to die because everybody's demanding. Just imagine going to a court of law and the case goes against you because of the majority that is shouting. That's a very poor judgment, isn't it? Eh? Judgments are not given by asking who's got the majority. <laughs> the court goes only by the law book. But here is Pilate sending him to be crucified, knowing that he has nothing, he's done nothing wrong, but because everybody claims that he must die, everybody uh, demands the death of the crucifixion of Jesus, he hands him over and he dies. So this man, son of God, sinless person, dies in most unusual circumstances. The horrible death he dies. And then, third day he rose again. And then the third thing is, he is living until today. <laughs> Have you heard of anything like this? Now, see, sometimes when you're in church, these things become very, you know, ordinary. Because you're hearing it all the time, singing about it all the time. It sounds ordinary. If I was listening to some kind of story by someone, and he said God came and took, took a man's body and came into this world. He took on human flesh and came in this world and died a horrible death. And then on the third day he rose again and that he is living until this day and that salvation is available through him. I will cancel all other appointments and listen to this story. Because if this is true, then my whole life and my future rests on this fact. If this is true, then I must pay attention to that. I cannot just hear it and go away. I cannot consider this as an ordinary thing. This is not an ordinary matter. Which religion, which system of belief has any story like this, that a man came, died, rose again, and he's alive till today, and he can forgive my sins. On the basis of the shed blood, my sins can be forgiven. There is nothing in the whole world like that. If this is true, then I say to you, this is the most important single event in all of human history. There is nothing that can compare with it. Not only that, the remedy is a perfect remedy. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that. Verse 14. Perfect remedy. What is a perfect remedy? Let's read it. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. Look at the way he puts it. By one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. The being sanctified indicates a progressive work, but what he did is indicated by a perfect work. That is, it's completed. It's perfectly perfect, completely complete. Eh? That's the way you should put it. There's nothing left in that to do anymore. You can't look at the cross and what Jesus has done there and say, well, I think he missed out one item there. We need to add this to that. No, there is nothing to add because it is perfect. Or there, you can't look at the cross and say, we need to take one thing out of it. No, there is nothing to take out, nothing to add because it is the perfect work. Nothing is missing there. It's perfectly done. It's a perfect work. It's perfectly perfect and completely complete. There is nothing to be added, nothing to be taken away. It is done perfectly. When God does it, he does it perfectly. Then why it says in the progressive sense about us that we are being sanctified. Because the way we received the benefits that come through the shed blood is progressive. What the blood has done, it has done completely and finished. We receive it slowly. Why? Because we are human beings and we follow all kinds of things to just to believe this thing, it takes some, some time. See how long it takes for me to preach this thing, you know. I'm going to preach for many weeks on this. It takes so long to just get it in and when I preach it, I know there are some people sitting there and saying, I doubt that. <laughs> you know, because I heard once that that's not true. How can that be? You know, 
How can one man die and everybody be saved? How can one man die and everybody's sins will be forgiven? How can this happen? I doubt. See, I was born in this background, born as a preacher's kid, raised in the church. It took me so long to believe all these things. Because most of the time they told me I have to die in order to receive all that has been done on the cross of Calvary. So for us, our death was the main thing, you know. So we always, when we reached, reached about 40, 50 years of age, we said, Lord, I'm ready to come. <laughs> you know, we thought, let's die quickly because when we go to heaven, we'll enjoy everything and it's going to be good. Because before you die, you can't have anything good. You're going to suffer here only and only suffering is here. And all the blessings and enjoyment of life is going to be in heaven only, nothing here. I thought that for a long time because they said in heaven only, all the good things are there. Here, only suffering. I must die to get all the blessings. The day I die is the most glorious day because I'm going to enter into heaven and enjoy very much my life. But then I found out the Bible teaches exactly opposite. It's not I die and enter into the blessing. It's he died so that I may enter into the blessings. Amen. How different it is. You know, you just put it slightly different, you're lost. That's it. He died so that he may give you everything, but you still can't catch, enjoy anything because they told you, you have to die to get there. Hello. I've been there. That's why I'm telling you. <laughs> I don't want you to be there. I'm telling you, you don't have to die. Your death does nothing, my friend. His death, death has done everything. Amen. His death has done everything. So that is progressive. See, even though he has done it perfectly already 2,000 years ago when he died on the cross, shed his blood, everything, his work is done perfectly, perfectly provided everything that I need that I would ever need. The knowledge of these things comes to me progressively, therefore only progressively can I enter into the benefits and the blessings that the cross has brought into my life. Day by day, I'm understanding. More and more, I'm understanding. For some years, I never understood certain things. I never entered into those blessings, but because never so, nobody told me so clearly. That is, why, that is one of the reasons I began to teach as clearly as possible, as simply as possible, so that even a little kid can understand. I try to make it simple. Because I've been there where I sat there and I never understood anything. I just sat there and wondered what's happening, you know. They'll be running up and down shouting and I said, wow, you know, what is he saying? And when we came home in our house after Sunday church, you have to tell what the preacher preached, otherwise no food, you know. <laughs> so I tried to listen very hard to understand, you know. Especially when some of these preachers came, I had a very tough time, you know, because I couldn't really catch what they're saying. They read one verse and that three points seemed to be, leave, read the verse, leave the verse, never come back to the verse, you know. <laughs> so I always noted down the verse. So when my grandmother asked, I can just give her the verse, say, listen, he preached on this. <laughs> what did he say? God only knows. You know. <laughs> At least if you showed the verse, you have a slight chance of getting your food that day. <laughs> but you see, it takes time for me. It's not easy. It doesn't, didn't come easily. I had to learn. I had to, I had to go into that. I had to get into that. Even when, I, when somebody preached it, I couldn't get it immediately. So many things, I had to listen so many times. I would buy some of these things the way they taught and listen to it again and again and again and again until I got it. You know, keep the Bible and look at it and look, listen and talk to others and discuss it and come back to it, listen again, so that I may get it. It didn't come easily. So that is why... It says, the one offering he has perfected, by the one offering he has perfected forever. That one offering 2,000 years ago has done a perfect work, done everything perfectly, and that lasts forever. But it says, those who are being sanctified. When it's talking about us, it says, we are being sanctified. So only progressively, the thing is happening to us. All right. 
the, so it is a perfect work. It's a wonderful work. The appropriation happens progressively. I hope, uh, you know, a lot of you begin to appropriate it now. Uh, begin to appropriate one by one as we cover some of the things that have been done through the blood of Jesus. When the blood of Jesus was shed on the cross and the sacrifice was made, it unlocked treasures of God's provision. It was like a whole go down full of provisions God wanted to give to me. It was kept there for me. And throughout all eternity, God has planned it, purposed it, kept it for me. But when Jesus died on the cross and shed his blood, that was the key that unlocked God's provision for me. So the cross is the center of the gospel. That's why. Why? Because it is when he died, it is when he shed the blood, all the things God opened up for me. I was given entry into all the blessings of God. Until then, sin was a factor. It kept me away from God's blessings. But when the, when the cross happened, when the blood was shed, that is when all of God's provision was made available to me. It, was, it unlocked a treasure house of God's provisions for me. So I say to you that the cross is the center of the gospel. It has to be at the center of the gospel. You cannot, you can teach about all kinds of blessings, but no blessing is possible without the cross. That's why you should never divert from the cross. You have to be grounded in the cross. You can talk about this, that, and everything, but nothing works without the cross. It is the center. Now, the fact that cross is the center is revealed in Isaiah in a very wonderful way. Go back to Isaiah 53. I spent all this time just to come back here. In Isaiah 53, go to verse 4 to 6. But I want to show you how wonderfully God reveals the fact that the cross is the center of the gospel, is the foundation of the gospel. It is from the cross the whole gospel takes shape. You take the cross, there is no gospel. That's it. Everything comes, comes from the cross. That fact is revealed in the book of Isaiah. So let, let's see that. How many, how many chapters are in the book of Isaiah? Anybody knows? 66, correct. That's good. You've been reading your Bible. How many books are in the Bible? 66, see there. Isaiah is divided into two divisions. People who study Isaiah have said that Isaiah comes in two divisions. Some have even suggested it may be two authors. But let's leave that alone. It's two divisions. 1 to 39 is the first division. 40 to 66 is the second division. 1 to 39, 39 chapters. The rest of it is 27 chapters. 40 to 66 is 27, not 26, because you add 40 also, you know. Count from 40. It's 27. How many books are in the Old Testament? 39. How many books are in the New Testament? 27. So they have said, those who have studied Isaiah for many years and been experts at it, they say that in Isaiah there is a New Testament. Referring to chapters 40 to 66. They say, within Isaiah, you can find the entire New Testament within Isaiah. So they've called Isaiah New Testament in the Old Testament. Over sin, he is conquered, hallelujah, he is conquered over death, victorious, hallelujah, victorious over sickness, he is triumph, hallelujah, he is triumph, Jesus reigns over all. Over sin, over sin. He is conquered, hallelujah, he is conquered over death, victorious, hallelujah, victorious over sickness, he is triumph, hallelujah, he is triumph, Jesus reigns over all. 
joyous over sickness. He's triumphed. Hallelujah. He's triumphed. Jesus reigns over all. Over sin. Over sin. He's conquered. Hallelujah. He's conquered. Over death. Victorious. Hallelujah. Victorious over sickness. He's triumphed. Hallelujah. He's triumphed.